Welcome to American History Gazette. I'm Jake Suggs, and today we are joined by Tim Gray. Tim is the president, founder, and filmmaker at the World War II Foundation, where he's interviewed countless World War II veterans and has had 34 films aired on PBS nationally. Tim, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Now, you've had multiple films and documentaries on the invasion of Normandy, which is also known as D-Day, which was one of the most pivotal events of the entire Second World War. But this took place on June 6, 1944, five years after the war started. So I, I think it's important to set the stage for the invasion. By 1944, Hitler and Nazi Germany basically had complete control over Europe. So what was the context of the war going into June of 1944? <clears throat> you know, D-Day is, is always referred to as um, something that Joseph Stalin wanted, which was a second front in, in the West. Um, the war at that point, the Soviet Union had been bearing the brunt of, of World War II. So they appeased him um, a little bit earlier in the war with the, um, with the invasion of, of North Africa and then in the Sicily and Italy, which Churchill called the soft underbelly. But there was always that pressure to get another front to, to divide the German forces, to get them to focus on the West um, rather than just on what was going on in the East and what was going on, you know, at that point in, in Italy. So it was imperative for the Allies to kind of start that front and sandwich the Germans in between um, the Allies, the, the Americans and the British and the Canadians, and then, and then the Soviet Union over here. So it really split the resources of, of Germany. And all those um, soldiers, a lot of them who had been with their divisions fighting on the Eastern Front were all of a sudden sent through central France and, and towards Normandy uh, because of the, the threat there. So really, it marked the end of um, Adolf Hitler's control of Europe. And it was just one of those amazing and critical moments in history where in one 24-hour period, the history of the world could have gone either way. If, if the Germans had been able to push the Allies back into the channel, the war probably would have gone on another couple of years. And, you know, there would have been a lot of casualties and the Americans would start to have to think again about you know, going back into Europe, how they were going to do it. You know, are we going to go through the same way? Are we going to just keep going up through Italy? Are we going to go up through Greece? Um, you know, what, what, what's the plan? But, but fortunately, um, it did work and it really kind of changed the outcome of the war. It was a defining moment of the war. If you're looking for the defining battle of World War II, I think most historians would agree that Stalingrad was the defining battle of, of what was going on um, in that part of the world for World War II. And um, so, again, there, there, are only, there are critical moments throughout World War II that you can look back on and say, wow, you know, this thing was really up for grabs. And if it had gone the other way, what would have been, you know, the result? So that's kind of the layman's term um, of D-Day. You could spend weeks and months talking about D-Day and the planning leading up to D-Day in Operation Fortitude, which was the deception plan to make the Germans think that the Allies were going to land at Pas de Calais. Um, so the Germans kept the 15th Army up there instead of bringing them to Normandy. I mean, there's so many subplots with secrecy and, and fake armies and Patton and, and um, you know, Operation Mincemeat and, and the, all these other things to, you know, to make the Germans think one thing was going to happen. And then in reality, it was something totally else. And that's that's what D-Day was. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And all the deception, I really want to get into that later. But you brought up a great point that the history of the world really was could have gone either way within 24 hours. If it was an unsuccessful invasion, you're right, Hitler and Nazi Germany would have kept control and continued their reign. And the Soviets definitely were getting a short end of the stick. Stalin was adamant about getting them to open up that second front so that they could split the Nazis. And Stalingrad was definitely a very decisive battle because it kind of flipped the switch on the Nazis pushed east. It kind of stalled that. And then from there, it was a slow withdrawal and slow decay. And same thing with Normandy. Once we had that successful invasion, it was basically just a slow decay of the Nazi empire. But 
the Allies had been trying to kind of gain a foothold in continental Europe. And in 1942, they actually had an unsuccessful raid of the port of Dieppe. So can you kind of briefly talk about that and maybe how that played into the planning of D-Day and the invasion of Normandy? As big a disaster um, as Dieppe was, the Allies learned all of the the tragic lessons that they would put into play for D-Day. So Dieppe was a disaster for the British. It was a disaster for the Canadians. Uh, it was a it was a disaster for American commandos who were a part of that raid as well, a smaller contingent. But but the landing there and 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 it just taught the Allies so many lessons about when to land, how to land, um, you know, planning, support, everything. So you know, Dieppe was really they studied the failure at Dieppe and that led to the success of Normandy. Yeah, it it definitely played into the planning and they definitely learned a lot of a lot of lessons from that. But the invasion of Normandy and D-Day was years of planning. It, it wasn't just kind of a spur of the moment thing. It had been planning for years and it really wasn't until they appointed Eisenhower as commander, Supreme commander of the allied forces that planning really sped up in 1943. So how really, how long was the preparation and how thorough was the preparation? Because it was years. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at a plan that was probably two, two years in the making. And, you know, within that time frame, they're looking at other options. You know, there's a reluctance um, by the Americans. There's a reluctance because they don't have enough landing craft to to attempt uh, a landing in Normandy in 1943. So they have to wait for certain things to happen. So, yeah, I mean, it's just um, <clears throat> you go back in history and, you know, things happen for a reason. Um, they appointed Eisenhower as the, the commander of all allied forces in Europe, which was the smartest thing they could have done. He wasn't a tactical, um, you know, in the field type of general, but what he was, was a manager of people and situations. And there was nobody better to manage um, Montgomery, to manage Churchill, to manage Patton, to manage uh, Roosevelt, to manage um, General Marshall, um, even though Eisenhower reported to General Marshall, Eisenhower was the perfect person to also deal with the Free French, to deal with de Gaulle and everything. So when you look back um, at hires in history, you say Eisenhower was the perfect man for the perfect job at the perfect time in history because of his management skills, his art of being able to work with other people and put his uh, ego aside and, and, and also understand that the people he's working with have tremendous egos all the way from de Gaulle down through Patton and Churchill and, and the British staff and Montgomery and everybody. So, you know, it hit his appointment, while not celebrated in any fashion by the British, um, I think you have to give a lot of credit to Churchill for recognizing that he was the most even-tempered person to lead and keep that coalition together. And and, and that's what he did. So, and but then you, you start to look at other facets of it, the secrecy and the planning and how Montgomery was involved in the planning. And from a strategical standpoint, Montgomery was, was in, you know, looking it over and saying, I think we need another airborne division involved here. And, and um, so, you know, I, I, I think... All the right people were in the right place on, on, on D-Day, and they were all commanded by the perfect person to do that. Um, but, you know, everything had to, to fall into place. And as you know, with any battle plan, once the first bullet is, is fired, then everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And when that happened on D-Day, still on D-Day, especially with the paratrooper drops all over the place and what went wrong on Omaha Beach, especially, and in some other um, hot and heavy areas, um, the Allies had a better plan of um, of being on um, having a stronger initiative, being able to take see a plan failing and take it over and make it right, where the Germans were always waiting for someone to tell them what to do. So while Hitler slept, you know the tanks could have been moving towards Normandy, but everybody was afraid to wake Hitler up. Rommel was in control of Normandy, but he was home in Herlingen, Germany, for his wife's 50th birthday party and brought her some pretty shoes from Paris and everything. So all the people who needed to make quick decisions on the German side 
didn't, weren't there, were sleeping, whatever you want to, whatever you want to say. So when it comes to initiative, the Allies had it, the Germans not so much. So the Germans could see what was going wrong, but yet they have to wait for Hitler to make a decision and then von Rudstadt and then Rommel. So I, I think it's initiative that, that got the Allies ashore on D-Day and the Germans never reacted, reacted in time. And Rommel knew, and Rommel told the generals that if we're going to win this battle of, of, the, of the coast of France, of, of um, the invasion, which Rommel believed would, would eventually end up in Normandy, that we're going to have to stop them at the water. And the other generals were like, well, I think it's more important that we bring the tanks in at some point. If they land, that's fine. We'll bring the tanks in. They'll, they'll solve the problem. That wasn't the case. Rommel was right. You needed to not let them ever get a foothold in Europe. And once they had that foothold in Europe, it was the industrial capacity of the United States and the supply chains and everything else that keep, kept feeding Normandy and, and bringing in all the supplies. And once they were ashore, they weren't going to go anywhere. So that's really when the, 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 the Germans lost in Europe. And even Rommel recognized that, um, you know, by July, he was telling Hitler that you need to sue for peace. You need to sue the West for peace so we can stop the Soviets. We can focus on the Soviets from, from coming in from the Soviet Union. And Rommel was right. You know, millions more Germans died unnecessarily. The Soviets took over half of Germany uh, in 1945. So Rommel knew that the war in Europe was lost. Um, right after D-Day, but Hitler wouldn't listen. And Rommel was one of the few generals who would speak up to Hitler, one of the only generals. And for that, he was forced to commit suicide, you know, later in, in 1944, um, a few months after, um, after he was seriously wounded in Normandy. Um, so yeah, you know, it's just, there are just so many personalities and decisions that you can look back and say, well, if this had happened, it would have been different. And, um, it's just that's the how that's how it, it works in World War Two. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It, it kind of was a perfect storm for the Allies on D-Day, even though there was a lot that went wrong. Like you said, Hitler was asleep that the Germans knew an invasion was coming and they were prepared for it and they were just waiting for the day. But when that day arrived, Hitler's asleep. Hitler appointed Rommel, his best general, to the Atlantic coast so they could stop the invasion. Hitler's a, or uh, Rommel's away in Germany with his wife's birthday. So the Allies really got lucky, and you were talking earlier about Eisenhower and his management of people and egos. I'm reading The Liberator right now by Alex Kershaw, and it's really funny to hear uh, you know, all the ego battles between Montgomery and Patton and Eisenhower just kind of trying to be a stoic manager, but that's beside the point. I, I, want, I urge everyone to listen to Eisenhower's speech that he gave before D-Day. You're about to embark on a great crusade. It's, I think, one of the best speeches in military history during one of the most important moments in military history. And one of, one of, the, one of the, I was going to mention, Jake, one of, the, one of the best speeches that he ever wrote that was never used was Eisenhower's taking blame for the landings if they if they had not been successful. So in addition to giving the message, he, he writes out, you know, a, a, a letter uh, if the if the invasion had failed, he was taking full responsibility for it. I can't think of a better manager than to take full responsibility for the plan. He said, you know, if there's anyone to blame for this invasion not being successful, it's me. And fortunately, that, that letter never had to, to go anywhere. It stayed with Eisenhower. And we have a framed um, picture of it in our office just to remind people that it's it's about working together as a team and, and, and leadership and taking responsibility and, and everything else. I think that's one of the greatest examples of history of, of someone saying, it's, it's, it's all on me if this fails. And thankfully, um, it didn't fail. Well, wow, I, I never, I never knew that. That's very noble of him. That, that definitely is a testament that he was the right man for the job to take that accountability if things were to go wrong. But a couple of episodes ago, I had on Lynn Marks, who's an amphibious operations expert. And we talked about all the amphibious operations in the Pacific that started in 41. So how did what the Marines learn in the Pacific, did that affect the Allied invasion at Normandy in any way? 
I mean, they used Higgins boats early on, so they knew they they knew the use of Higgins boats would prove effectual for delivering Allied troops right onto the shore. So Higgins boats were were became famous during Normandy, were, but were being used by the Marines, um, you know, in in the Pacific earlier in the war. Um, one of the things that people don't realize about World War II. Um, and there's a perfect example of this on Netflix. But when you watch Band of Brothers and you watch the Pacific, you don't realize how different each theater of war was in terms of the environment, uh, in terms of the adversary, the enemy that you're fighting. Um, the war in the Pacific was just a brutal and savage war. And you were they learned that the Marines learned that early on in Guadalcanal. And it was almost like they were two separate wars. So when guys in the Pacific would hear about something happening in Europe, they wouldn't care. You know, they were so far removed from what was going on in Europe. They're almost in a totally different world. So, um, you know, I, I, I think comparing what happened in Europe to what happened in the Pacific, um, I don't think there's much of a comparison, really, um, with and again, I go back to the Pacific on HBO that did such a great job of portraying what these Marines went through and the enemy. So if you were, you know, you weren't going to get your enemy to surrender in the Pacific. They were going to die for the emperor. And what they wanted to do was, was take you with them. But in terms of dealing with an enemy that wouldn't surrender, if you surrendered, your chances of dying in a prisoner of war camp in the Philippines or in Japan were extremely high compared to what it was in Europe. So I always tell people, look at Europe, look at the Pacific in two totally different lenses, and then mm. you will see the savagery. And, you know, when those guys would get news of, of D-Day in the Pacific, they're like, mm, OK, that's great. You know, I got a brother in Europe. I might give a thought about him. But but they were so wrapped up in, in what was going on in the Pacific that it didn't translate to what was going on in Europe. What did translate once in a while were generals. You would have generals who would be in the Pacific who would be moved to Europe and they would they would lend their expertise um, and their strategy um, to to both theaters of war, and I thought that was that was always interesting um, from that perspective. But as far as your initial question about learning, I, I I don't. They were just such different environments and such different enemy and such different strategy and the island hopping and you know the the things that these guys went through in the Pacific with malaria and and dengue fever and jungle rot and everything else. Um, I think the guys in Europe will tell you they had a lot of respect for the guys who who fought in the Pacific. And um, so I've learned so much just traveling over to some of these places like Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima and Peleliu and everything um, to see the environment and witness firsthand the environment that these guys were in and the Japanese all in 500 caves on Peleliu and waiting for the Marines to come to them and what a savage fight it was that... Um, I think there's always things you can learn, but since these two, um, since these two theaters were so different, that there wasn't a lot learned in the Pacific. I think that could be applied to what was going on in Europe. Just, you know, there were a lot, a lot of large tank battles in the Pacific, and that was mostly because of the environment. Whereas in Europe, once you broke out of the Bocage in Normandy, there were a lot of tank battles that took place in tank, tank country. So, yeah, you, you, you know, you do, do pick up some things, but I, I, I just think two separate wars. Yeah, no, that's a great point because it really was two completely different theaters of war in terms of the geography and landscape and the enemy. I mean, you're looking at Pacific Islands and then a main continent. So I could see how, you know, the, the knowledge didn't really translate because it's, it's just applicable in two, two different areas. So. Yeah, I mean, you look at Europe. Europe was more of the Army's war. Uh, the Pacific was more of the Navy and Marines war. And that's just kind of, you know, how they they kind of referenced it. And veterans I've talked to have always said, yeah, I was in the Army. That was my war in Europe. And my brother was in the Pacific and his war was um, and, and that's where his war was fought and everything. So they were they were very different. But, you know, in, in some in some 
uh, ways war is war and strategy is strategy. But when that strategy is taking you through a jungle and, you know, it's dark, um, you know, I don't know if they've learned anything from from fighting in the jungles that could be applied to the Hurkin forest, for example, which was a forest that was kind of like jungle. It was totally dark and branches everywhere. And whether that happened or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, with the amount of casualties in the Hurkin forest, I, I, I think that probably a lot of lessons weren't learned from from anything as far as jungle fighting in the Pacific. Yeah. And I think you, you also brought up a great point with, um, you know, when they were whether you're in the Pacific or Europe, you, you don't care about what's going on over there. You're so, I mean, it's your combat every day, traumatic experiences. You're with your brothers on the battlefield. It's like, you could care less what's happening across the world. And I think the Pacific did a really good job at that. But back to Normandy, we talked a little bit earlier that, you know, Hitler and Rommel were aware that there was going to be invasion and they had this, you know, the infamous Atlantic wall, their, their impenetrable, um, defenses that that lined hundreds of miles along the whole Atlantic coast of Europe. So, really, how aware were the Germans that the invasion was going to take place? Did they know it was going to happen in Normandy? Were they expecting it at the Cadet Palais? And really, how formidable was the Atlantic Wall? I think there was an inkling, in in a feeling, in some of. Um the leaders of the Atlantic Wall and and the um, the the Germans in the West that Normandy kind of fit the uh, profile of where they would land, but there was never a full commitment to that. I think it was just always it's going to be the shortest point between France and England, so f- there will be fighter support. There'll be it's you're going to go. Usually, if you're going to go somewhere, you know, you put your GPS on, it's going to take you the shortest, most direct route. And that would have been from England to Patakalai, which is about 20 miles across the channel. So you've got you've got England, you've got Great Britain, you've got about 19 to 20 miles, and then you have Patakalai. So, again, building up the fictitious army with General Patton in charge, Operation Fortitude with the dummy tanks, the dummy radio traffic, the dummy trucks, the dummy jeeps, um, dummy troops, um, And this isn't a time, you know, they had turned all of the German spies by then and they were keeping the German Luftwaffe away from that part of the coast. So there, you know, there was no real way for the Germans to find out where this invasion was going. So they always looked at most logically Pas de Calais. And there was the great agent, uh, double agent Garbo, who would send um, telegrams over to the Germans and they they had bought into Garbo and, and all of his um, messages that he was sending. And even after D-Day, he said the target was still Pas de Calais and that Normandy was a diversion. And a month after D-Day, the Germans still believe, some still believe that Pas de Calais was still going to be the site of the invasion and Normandy was still a diversion. And this is a month after June 6, 1944. So the Allies had done such a great job with the deception plan that even a month after D-Day, the Germans are still like, we still think something big is coming at Pas de Calais. So they kept the 15th Army up there. They could not be fighting um, in, in Normandy against the Allies. So that was the big strategic plan of the Allies was to keep the 15th Army up there. And they did for a very long time. They didn't get into the fight until it was much too late. So Operation Fortitude had a huge role because the Allies controlled that whole theatrical performance and and they were feeding the Germans information. Some of it was right, some of it was wrong, but everything pointed to Pas de Calais. But Rommel, being a, a great thinker, and he was, he was a great strategist, great general, high, highly respected by the Allies, was not a member of the Nazi party. Rommel always had the inkling that it would be the coast of, of Normandy. But when you only have so many troops to spread along you know, those hundreds of miles of the Atlantic Wall, um, you know, you, you, you can't put them everywhere. And the Atlantic Wall was like almost like the Siegfried Line or the Maginot Line. It was a wall in name only. You know, there, were, there was not, you know, the, it was more of a myth than anything. And while it did do a lot of destruction uh, at Omaha Beach on D-Day, um, 
it was really more of a, of a, of a propaganda than anything. The wall was not finished. It was nowhere, nowhere near where Rama wanted it. He didn't have time to put his four million mines. He gets two million down. So, you know, his goal was to strengthen that entire coast. And how can you do that from, you know, Norway, Norway down through Spain or, you know, that, that whole thing? It's impossible. So um, the Allies did a great job selling it. And, um, you know, even you go to Patacale today and there are a lot of big bunkers still there pointing out towards the English Channel. And and that's where they thought it was going to happen. And um, but Operation Fortitude really, um, you know, and, and it's interesting because while they're leading up to D-Day, the Allies are bombing, obviously, Normandy and the rail lines leading into Normandy. But they're also bombing Patacale and they're also bombing other targets. So they're not giving the Germans much information on where this is actually going to take place. Um, so um, still, though, there was when you think about what happened on Omaha Beach on D-Day, um, the invasion still could have failed at that point, even though it was working well at Utah Beach and it was working OK at, at Sora Juno Gold uh, and the paratroopers were were behind the causeways. It was still Omaha Beach. Those guys, the 1st Infantry and the 29th were almost pulled off by by um, Bradley. You know, there was a decision that had to be made because they were getting slaughtered and couldn't move. So um, but they didn't. And the guys got inland. Yeah, that's interesting. If if only, you know, Hitler would have listened to his best general, perhaps it would have been a different story. But we've we've kind of been talking a little a little bit about it, dancing around it, and I really want to get deep into it now because to me the whole plan of deception and, and the all the theatrics of it is the most interesting and fascinating thing to me. It, it's honestly pretty comedic how they fooled the Germans with some of the tactics they employed. So Walk me through how the Allies were able to pull off that deception. I mean, they set up entire armies of inflatable tanks and trucks and imp uh, appointed Patton to this fictitious army. Yeah, I mean, they <clears throat> the Germans expected, as you saw in the movie Patton with George C. Scott, that <clears throat> they expected Patton, who they felt was was the Allies' best general, to, to lead the invasion um, wherever it took place. So Patton was being a bad boy at the time. We know we know from watching the movie what he was up to between slapping soldiers and making comments about our, our Russian allies at Nutsford in England in front of a women's group. Um, so Patton was on double secret probation, to use an animal house term right there. And um, they had planned for Patton to get back into the war after D-Day. But so they took advantage of the fact that their most famous general, who, again, the Germans considered to be our best, would would be the leader of this fictitious army that was being set up. So um, <clears throat> with a lot of feedback from folks in, um, in the theatrical business and the prop business, the prop world and everything else, um, this plan came together to build this fictitious army around the man that the Germans thought would lead the invasion. And they would build these rubber tanks and rubber trucks that were being built in Woonsocket, Rhode Island at the Alice Mill. And they, we interviewed workers who worked on them and they had no idea what they were doing. She's like, they just told us to paint these rubber tanks and that's all we did. We painted these rubber tanks. And um, in this Alice Mill in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, also built all the barrage balloons. But they're, they don't, nobody knows why they're doing all this. People back then weren't asking questions. They were just told to build dummy tanks and trucks and jeeps and, and planes. And these guys are, are taught this radio traffic to go back and forth to, to make it look like it's going between, you know, various camps and being picked up by. So, I mean, the whole thing was a play. It was a ruse. And um, and I and I thought it was just one of those things that probably saved thousands of lives. And when you look back on it, um, people still talk about and books are written about Operation Fortitude and what went into it and and everything else that it's just one of those things where when you have control of everything, you've got control of all the German spies, you've got control of the skies, you've got control of anybody who could rat you out, you've got control of them. So 
it's just amazing that nothing ever got back to Germany that someone said they're rubber tanks, which would have set off you know, the alarm bell saying, why do they have rubber tanks? Well, they've got rubber tanks because they're not going to use them in the area we think they're going to use them. So that's kind of the layman's description of kind of how successful it was. And they also, again, I think the turning of the, the double agents was really big because they were feeding information back to the Germans saying, no, this is where it's going to happen. It's going to happen at Pas de Calais. So the Allies had turned these agents, these German agents, to, to working for them. Now they're feeding the Germans, it's going to be Pas de Calais. Even if you, th you think it's Normandy, it's going to be Pas de Calais. And so they, the Americans really had the entire setup. Um, you know, it was a very well-oiled machine in terms of the deception plan. Yeah, and it was very creative. I mean, talk about thinking outside the box with coming up with this kind of stuff. But I think you're right. The turning of the double agents was huge because the Germans really believed the spies and the information they were getting, and they really doubled down on it. But it finally comes time for the invasion. And initially, it's scheduled for June 5th, but weather and things of that nature push it back to the 6th. So June 6th, 1944... Um, right, right about after midnight, the C-47s take off with all the paratroopers, and the landing happens, the amphibious landing happens early in the morning, th around 6.30, I think. So can you kind of walk me through the initial stages of the invasion and how important were the role of the paratroopers who were coming in from the skies? Because I feel like a lot of the focus is on the army storming the beach and people kind of forget that there was also a massive force coming in from the skies. I think it's, it's interesting. Um, one of the going back to the fifth and, you know, the, they're, they're battling the weather elements in Normandy. Normandy is a very violent place weather wise. Their systems come in fast and then they leave fast. So at that point they had a, a window. They were told by um, a meteorologist from, um, a, a British meteorologist, uh, Captain Stagg, James Stagg. And he told them, you know, you can't go on the 5th. Conditions are not, you know, conditions are not good enough for the invasion. There will be a 48-hour window of opportunity where you could go on the 6th. So Eisenhower decided, based on Stagg's recommendation, this is um, early days of of meteorology. There are no satellites. There are no... You know, these are from buoys out in the North Atlantic and, 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 a, and a radar station in Iceland, basically giving him and his staff the opportunity to predict when the weather will be just over borderline for an invasion. So they picked the six. So then the paratroopers leave around 11 p.m. on the 5th. And their job, obviously, is to land in coordinated positions and back of the landing beaches and, and prevent German counterattacks from reaching the beaches as well as clearing the various causeways that lead to the beaches. But they're there to block the Germans at key areas like St. Mary Glees and St. Marie du Mont and in other locations um, in Normandy. They're there to block any German counterattacks. And... When they go in, as you've seen in Band of Brothers, um, the anti-aircraft and the low clouds, everything affects the paratrooper landing. So these guys are dropped all over Normandy. Some are 10 miles from their drop zone. Some are 15 miles. Some land at their drop zones. Um, but these guys are scattered all over, which in hindsight, you look back on it and say, they were scattered so much that the Germans didn't know where they were. So it's almost like you know, these sticks of 17 men could be dropped in an area, but then you have a stick being of 17 men being dropped over a five or six mile area. So the Germans start to think, wow, there are a lot more of these guys than there actually are because they're popping up everywhere, mostly because their C-47s have been blown off course. So they're there to fight in the early morning hours on D-Day. And the British Airborne actually takes the first objective there on D-Day, which is Pegasus Bridge in the, behind the British landing beaches. So um, that's a very important, very important objective, which was, of course, featured in the movie The Longest Day. So when the paratroopers land, um, they're supposed to join up with their fellow paratroopers, most of them 
you've got guys from the 82nd fighting with guys from the 101st. They don't know where they are. Some are wherever. They just are lost, but they're but they're forming these small bands and, and, and roaming around the, the, the hedgerows and, and disrupting German communications and counterattacks and everything. So the Germans are totally believing that these guys have landed everywhere in Normandy and that you know, it's a huge, huge invasion. So it caused a lot of confusion on the side of the Germans. Then you have the invasion beginning at the beaches um, at 6.30 a.m. And you have the 29th and the 1st American divisions landing at Omaha. Now, it's interesting that they paired the 1st and the 29th at Omaha, which, of course, is probably the most famous of all the landing beaches because that's where most of the killing was done um, of American um, soldiers. So you've got the, the 1st Infantry Division, which has already taken part in landings in uh, North Africa, Sicily, Italy. These guys have a lot of experience. So... On their right, they give them a green division, the 29th division, that's never taken part in an invasion at all. And they give them the Viverl sur mer section of Omaha Beach, where the 1st Infantry gets the uh, Colville sur mer section of, of the beach. So they're, they're fighting side by side down, down a long beach, obviously. But um, so, yeah, so they had the 1st to kind of reinforce the 29th to um, who, who were totally green. But um, you know, D-Day again is where were the Germans? Where were they supposed to be? Um, how did the Allies, how were the Americans able to cross 300 yards of open beach um, without any cover, just being shot at and shelled and mortars and artillery? Well, if you've ever stood on the beach and looked at low tide, you just say it's impossible for anybody to do this. But if you saw Saving Private Ryan, you know that Tom Hanks's character, um, he talks about you know, we have to move off the beach. We got to get off the beach. The only way to live is to move forward. So that's what those guys did, taking tremendous casualties on Omaha Beach, but they just kept moving forward. Um, and then they get to the bottom of the shale and then, you know, they're able to uh, get some, um, you know, defilade from, from heavy weapons and everything else. So they work their way inland. But, you know, it's, I'm not a book author. I'm more of a documentarian. So for me to, you know, there have been books written on, on nothing but the first two hours of D-Day. So to, for me to add anything other than I've just added, um, you know, you need to talk to Alex Kershaw and you need to, if you want the, like the real, you know, minute by minute, blow by blow. But from a, from my perspective, I look at it like, what are some of the most amazing, amazing things that came out of D-Day? Well, Fortitude is one. So we've done Fortitude in one of our films. Um, the, the coastline being three to 350 yards of just sand between, you know, the Americans landing on Omaha and, and the Germans on the bluff. Well, how does anybody in their right mind, you know, keep moving off when you all you have in front of you are guns. So that was another thing about D-Day. Um, we spent time with D-Day veterans who talked about in their sector, uh, the 29th, the 116th Regiment, their initial casualty rate was 85% in the first 15 minutes of, of the landing. And a whole 19 soldiers from one town in Bedford, Virginia, died in the opening day. And you mentioned Alex Kershaw, who wrote a great book called The Bedford Boys, which is about these 19 young men from this young men, boys from this one town in, in Bedford, Virginia, and how 19 of them died on just D-Day. And, and to me, I'm like, can you imagine what it was like in that town when all those telegrams, you know, started coming in? Um, so... You know, I, I, I like all the deception that played a role. And I think, boy, you know, we could not get away with any of that today. I mean, it would take one text, you know, from someone saying, hey, I see a bunch of ships heading across the English Channel. I wonder where they're going. You know, LOL. Um, you know, and, and so, I mean, those things we think about and say, that's probably the biggest secret in the history of the world, the Allied invasion of Normandy, and that the Germans were still, you know, waking up in the morning and be like looking out there and seeing 5,000 ships. And it's like, how do you keep a secret like that? No way today could that ever have been done. And how did they do it back then too? And they did, but they had a plan for it. And they're, you know, knock on wood, their plan worked. Yeah. It's just one of those moments in history where you look back on and you see it in movies and, and you see all these portrayals and you think, how I can't imagine what it was like to 
come up on a beach with entrenched machine gun positions and have to run up, you know, hundreds of yards of just open sand to get to my objective. And you had a you had a phenomenal answer. And we let's get into your area of expertise now. You've interviewed countless um, combat veterans from D Day. So what was it like to just be an average soldier sitting in that landing craft? driving up to the beach, what was going through their heads as they were getting ready to run up the beach into fire? They were mostly, believe it or not, worried um, just about doing their jobs. They're going through their training in their mind, and they're mostly worried about, like any soldier today even, this goes through all military of, of all generations, but what they're worried about is, is making sure that they just do their job and they don't let their fellow soldier down. So we've interviewed a lot of guys who took part in D-Day, and there's a common theme with these guys. I'm like, were you nervous before the, the ramp went down you know, on your Higgins boat? And they're like, yeah, I mean, you'd be stupid if you, you'd be ignorant and probably not alive to not be nervous, but I'm, I'm thinking about my training and everything. So some guys will say I was really scared. Some guys will say I was you know, thinking of my parents and my, my girlfriend back in Detroit. Some guys will say... I was going over my training or I was saying the Hail Mary. So a lot of it on your question is it all depends on, on the guy. I think most of them are worried about just doing their job. And you're young. You're 17, 18, 19, 20. You, you feel like you're invincible anyway. So it's not going to – I'm not going to get shot. It's going to be the guy over there or the guy over there. He's going to get shot. I'm not going to get shot. So you're invincible that way too. So – I think those are the kind of common themes that we've gotten out of veterans we've talked to. Those are the, some of the things that they've mentioned. Yeah, that's interesting. You see that time and time again when talking about soldiers is that selflessness and they, they really only care for the guy next to them. And it's crazy to see and, and you really can't experience it unless you've taken part with it taken part in it. I had a Vietnam veteran on a couple episodes ago and he was saying the same thing. You know, you'd give anything for your brothers. It just seems time and time again throughout any war, any military conflict in history, that just that theme of selflessness. And it, it's just so admirable. But the the smoke settles, they, they ultimately take the beaches. And I would also like to emphasize that there were five total beaches that the allies were storming and the Americans actually were only taking part in two of them. And that was Omaha and Utah. So I think that's an important distinction to make when looking at the scale and the entirety of the conflict. But ultimately the allies achieved their objectives and take the beaches. So in total, what were the casualties looking like after D-Day? Um, <clears throat> that's always a good question. I, I, I never like to blurt it out because there, there are so many, I mean, if you're looking, you know, on what happened, you know, I hate to even give you a number. I really, because someone will always, when I, when I give out facts about numbers and stuff, I will always get the proverbial, no, it was a hundred more. It was a hundred less or anything like that. So yeah. several thousand is what, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, 10,000 casualties on D-Day, um, you know, for, for, you know, how many killed? Well, a lot more killed on Omaha beach than the 284, you know, down on, on Utah. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot less than they had pro projected as far as casualties. And again, Omaha, you know, was, was put up a, a huge fight. Some of the, the Canadian British beaches as well. Um, Utah, not so much. Um, so the guys who were, you know, went in there with the fourth infantry division did not suffer as much as the guys of the first and the 29th did on Omaha beach. So, um, but you know the the casualties varied. It wasn't it wasn't it it, it was enough, you know mm -hmm. enough that it still shocked people, but um, you know not not enough as uh, as some of the the especially English generals had predicted. Yeah, it's just it's tragic, nevertheless. Despite them possibly saving the world at that time from from Nazi Germany, it's tragic, nevertheless. And their bravery and their heroics is just not to be understated. But after all these years, you know, you've interviewed a lot of veterans. What's kind of the biggest takeaway you've had in terms of how they feel about D-Day and their experience there and how they talk about it? They're all, Jake, they're all so humble. Uh, 
I mean, to get these guys to say anything remotely heroic about themselves will take an act of Congress. So here you've got these 17, 18, 19, 20, 25 year olds who save the world. All right. And they don't want to talk about it. They don't want any credit for saving the world. They want to say, I want you to remember my buddy who was killed with me. He's the real hero. He's buried in Normandy or Holland at Margraten or in Hom, Luxembourg, next to General Patton, um, or somewhere in the Pacific at the Punch Bowl or in Manila. So what they like to do is, is if you call them a hero, they'll say, you know, my buddy Joe is a hero. He's, he's buried in Normandy. So I think there's some survivor's guilt that, that lingers. The second part is they don't like to tell these stories to their own family members. So what they'll do is they'll tell their, their story to his perfect stranger like, like me on camera. Um, and his family member will come up to us after the interview and they will say, this is the first time we ever heard this story. We had no idea he landed at Iwo Jima. We had no idea he was ever wounded. Um, so we find that these guys are at a, at a point in their lives where they're willing more often than not to open up. But it's got to be somebody from the outside a lot of the times. Not all the time, but a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. It's got to be almost a perfect stranger because these guys don't want to burden their families from what they did when they were younger and their country asked them to do. And also they don't want to burden them from, you know, thinking any less of them for, for the positions that they were were put in or the, or the horrific scenes that they saw. So it's a very humble generation. Um, they came out of the great depression. They were all very, um, you know, they were all very hardened. They went and fought a world war as a job. They came home, they went on with their lives. They rebuilt a modern America. Um, but they didn't want to talk about it. And, um, they're very reluctant to be called heroes. And I think that's, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah, no, it's remarkable the level of humility that they all show. I mean, it's very rare. I would say never will you find a soldier who's boasting about the stories or the things that he saw or the things that he did. And yeah, it's truly remarkable when you look back on it because these are literally heroes who saved the world. And we would be living in a completely different world today if it wasn't for the successful invasion of Normandy, I'm sure. So give it up for them and their and their bravery and their courage and their heroics. But that wraps up our conversation. I want to thank you so much for coming on. I'm a huge admirer of your work in the World War II Foundation. I'm going to link it below so you guys can go check it out and, and download the app. They have a ton of amazing documentaries on there with all kinds of interviews from, from veterans from all over World War II. So you guys check that out. And Tim, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Jake. Anytime.